afternoon, everyone. Good evening to our friends in Ireland, and I think it's still good morning to our friends on the West Coast. Welcome to today's webinar, Moore Street, Birthplace of the Republic. Joining us from the AOH today is Chris Cook, who's running our IT and is also the state president of North Carolina. Sean Pender, our national vice president. Judge McKay, our chairman of the Moore Street Monument. And our national historian, Dan Taylor, who will introduce our guest from Ireland. Dan. Thank you, Danny. Uh, when we think of the Easter Rising, we tend to think of the general post office on what was then Sackville Street, now O'Connell Street. And uh, the GPO, which opened for business in 1818, certainly makes a likely monument with its grand ionic columns, Georgian architecture, and even a statue of Hibernia resting on her spear holding a harp. Indeed, it was Pierce's reading of the proclamation there in front of the GPO on that Easter Monday that is considered the genesis of the modern Irish Republic. But there is a row of buildings far less grand, not far from the GPO, in which critical events of Easter week unfolded. On April 28th, with the GPO shattered by British artillery and in flames, the garrison evacuated under heavy fire to a row of nondescript buildings on nearby Moore Street. And it was there in number 16 Moore Street on April 29th that a fateful council of war was conducted by the leaders there assembled. Pierce, Plunkett, Clark, McDermott, and James Connolly, badly wounded as he was, made the decision to surrender in an effort to save civilian lives. It was a decision they made knowing what the outcome would be for them personally. And of course, it was the swift execution of these men and other leaders of the rising that alienated public opinion and helped to galvanize support for the cause of Irish independence. Those who have visited Dublin might recall Moore Street as a lively market district with vendors selling produce and other goods. But our guests today have spent many years in the fight to have the unassuming buildings that comprise the Moore Street battlefield restored, preserved, and recognized for their historical and cultural significance. Today, they will bring us up to date on the status of the Moore Street Terrace and competing plans for the development of the area. Patrick Cooney has been involved in a number of heritage-based campaigns. In his native East End of London, he helped secure the future of White Chapel Street Market and its Victorian facades. More recently, he was a member of the group that forced, somewhat ironically, an Irish developer to row back from the destruction of Spitafield's fruit and vegetable market. That arts and crafts style market building uh, dates from the late 19th century and uh, has been saved from demolition and is now a, a massive covered market that has become an internationally known premier shopping experience. Patrick initiated the Save 16 Moore Street campaign back in 2001 and is a committee member of that group. As a feature writer, he has contributed to amongst others, The Guardian, The Times, GQ, and The Independent. Patrick is the great grandson of the Cork Fenian, Michael Clark. James Connolly Heron is the great grandson of James Connolly and author of The Words of James Connolly, published by Mercer Press. After studying law at UCD, he became a practicing barrister and a founding member and secretary of the Irish Association of Democratic Lawyers. In 1966, James was the treasurer of the committee which successfully campaigned for the James Connolly Memorial in Dublin's Beresford Place. Uh, Sean Antona O'Murray is an architect, a design principal at Fwyniff Workshop Architects since 2009. He is an associate lecturer in applied technology at the Cork Center for Architectural Education, UCC, since 2016, and has been an architectural design studio tutor since 2018. Uh, Sean was the inaugural president of the Cork Architectural Association and is a contributing reviewer to numerous architectural journals. Patrick, uh, James, and Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Danny, and Danny, the historian. Uh, we're privileged to be able to address you all, and uh, I certainly think this is a, a unique experience for us on this side to shake hands across the ocean with our Hibernian brothers in America. I think it's probably useful, um, you gave a brief history of the terrace. I think it's probably useful if we just do a very short slideshow to give you an idea 
of the evacuation story, because some of you may have been in Moore Street, some of you may not have been. Uh, I've collected a number of images together, including a couple which have never been seen before. And so I'd like to take you through them. As we all know, the uh, Easter Rising uh, lasted approximately five days uh, before the GPO was evacuated on the night of Friday the 28th of uh, April 1916. Uh, the GPO was evacuated for the simple reason the roof was on fire. They were surrounded by enemy artillery and enemy forces and the building became unstable. They decided to evacuate through the side door of the GPO and into what was called the markets area. They were hoping to get to a very large uh, building, uh, a sweet factory, a confectionery factory, uh, approximately 10 minutes away and make some kind of glorious last stand there. Now, the first image you're looking at is a very rare image. Uh, this has been published before. As it says, it was turned into a postcard. You can see the inscription, Sackville Street in flames, a photograph taken by a daily sketch photographer under fire. If you look down, you'll see this photograph is taken from what we call the top end of uh, O'Connell Street. In the middle is the uh, back of the Parnell Monument. And then further on is the now sadly missing Nelson's Pillar. And if you look just to the right of that, there's a flare uh, of fire and explosion. In a blow up, you may just see the portico of the GPO. So this is an act, what you would call an actuality photograph. It is actually the only one we know of taken of the rising uh, while it was actually happening. Can I have the second image, please, Dan? Here's a very rare image. This is taken inside the GPO. It's two volunteers. Uh, there was a, I wouldn't say there was a photographer chronicling the event, there just happened to be a chemist who had a camera and he only took two photographs. We believe the rest were destroyed, but these are the only two you're going to see that actually survive. If he'd have swung his camera slightly to the left, you would be probably looking at Clark and Connolly and Pierce. But he photographed two uh, regular members of the Irish volunteers. We have their names, one's called Doyle, the other one's name escapes me and I haven't got it in front of me, but I can always tell you later. What's interesting is you can see that they were actually armed a, a, a little bit better than most people think. They have a cartridge belt, they have a bayonet, and they have the infamous Hoth Mauser rifles. A very, very interesting image. We don't know what part of the week this was taken, uh, probably the early part, because at the early part, nothing much was happening around the GPO, just a tightening of the cordon before the bombardment. Next slide, please. Here's the second image, which is even more remarkable. The two volunteers you saw in the previous image are in this group photograph, and there's a number of other men from the Irish Citizens Army and the volunteers. And look at the, the young lad who's closest to the camera. We, we worked out by the records that he was 15. He was in the Fianna. And as you know, in the GPO, there was members of the Irish Volunteers, the Irish Citizens Army, the Commandant and the FINA. This is the second of those remarkable images that was taken inside the GPO. It's not often seen for some reason. For example, you go into the GPO, you cannot buy a postcard of this. Extraordinary. Next slide, please. This gives an idea of the devastation and shows on the left of the image uh, an ornate portico. That's the side entrance of the GPO. And if you look above it, you'll see through the windows that the actual interior of the GPO was totally destroyed. And that's why we're very keen on saving Moore Street for all sorts of reasons, but more, most importantly, it's intact. If you enter the GPO of today, which I'm sure many of you have, you're entering essentially a 1930s building. The only thing that survives pre-1916 of the GPO is the front wall, the portico, and a small portion of the side walls. The entire interior was burnt out. So the side door, which you can see to the left of the image, 320 men, women, and boys, the garrison of GPO, 
ran across this street that you can see, Henry Street, and entered. The right hand side of the photograph is the entrance to Henry Place and what we refer to as the Markets District. Pierce stood at that doorway during the evacuation with his sword unsheathed and every time he dropped the sword, a portion of the garrison would run across because at the very end of the street, you can see, just behind that rather bald man's head was a British army barricade, which was manned with machine guns. And this side of the image, there was another barricade. So it was essentially, they were entering a shooting gallery. But amazingly enough, uh, the 320 to 340 got across without a single casualty. It's also the street across which the wounded James Connolly was carried on a stretcher uh, by uh, various people, including a great nephew of the great American Irish Fenian, John Devoy. Uh, the evacuation happened late on Friday evening and by the next morning, surrender was imminent. So the actual occupation of the Moore Street Terrace, which we're about to look at in the presentation, was almost just an, a night and a morning. That's all it was. The entire garrison, as I say, exited the GPO, 320 to 340, and they headed through the back lanes, hoping to get to the Williams and Woods confectionery factory. The O'Rahilly had previously been out on a recce. Uh, he had been shot and killed along with a number of men charging up Moore Street. It was only then they began to realize that they were surrounded and that there was no way they could get over to that confectionery building to make that last stand. Can I have the next image, please, Danny? This is uh, an image of a man who has been somewhat forgotten. It's the boy commandant, as he was known, Sean McLaughlin. As they entered Henry Place, confusion reigned. You have to understand that the vast majority of garrison were not battle-hardened men. They were young men who probably hadn't been under fire before. They'd spent a week in the GPO. They were underfed. They were uh, exhausted through lack of sleep. And command had essentially broken down. Connolly was wounded, uh, had been medicated with morphine. The other leaders weren't military men. And so as they entered Henry Place, it's been uh, chronicled that there was a whole breakdown in command. And a young man, Sean McLaughlin, took control. He managed to somehow uh, get the men together, made them realize that they had to get past another barricade through Moore Lane, and they had to dodge another fusillade of submachine gun fire and rifle fire. Uh, he got with Joe Plunkett, uh, a very large brewer's van, turned it on its side and blocked the laneway so that the men and women could go across the laneway without being hit. Unfortunately, a number of them were hit and one or two of them died on the way. This man um, was so impressed James Connolly that Connolly gave him his command. So Sean McLaughlin, who I think was a, a lieutenant or a lieutenant, as you say in America, was given Connolly's rank. He became Commandant General of the Dublin Division. And he didn't go on to become a public figure in Ireland. He ended up living in England. He, I believe, was a member of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party. He didn't fit in with the new Ireland. And he died, strangely enough, in complete and utter anonymity in England. I think it was in Sheffield he died. And it's only in recent years his story has been made public. And we're very happy that his family, the McLaughlins, his niece, Christina McLaughlin, is part of our relatives committee. Sean McLaughlin, a, a forgotten man, but forgotten no more. Can I have the next slide, please, Danny? This is an extraordinary image. It's the White House. No connection with your White House, I have to say. But you'll see halfway up, um, whitewash. The building was whitewashed. And all those pop marks is rifle fire and machine gun fire. This is Moore Lane. I just told you about a barricade being put across. Imagine you're looking at the screen and the barricade is right in front of you, shielding that building. 
that's the lane way they had to pass. And as you can see by the the, far, the, the, the pop marks on the building, it was, it was a death trap, but they did get across. This building still exists. It's been cement rendered and modified, but underneath the cement is the original building. And we believe when the render comes off, we will probably find those bullet marks. Uh, we found that a lot of the buildings that have been remodeled and look to be 1930s, 1940s, 1950s buildings are actually, when you peel away the layers of modification underneath is the 1916 battlefield. Next slide, please. This is Michael Mulverhill from Kerry. Uh, Michael was in the London Battalion of the Irish Volunteers with Michael Collins. He is one of the casualties who fell uh, on Moor Lane. Uh, if you go to see where Michael fell, it is a derelict laneway. Uh, there is no commemorative plaque. His family come there every year and they lay a wreath to his memory. Uh, there was four to five Kerrymen killed on Moor Street. Uh, it's the highest number from any county. Leo Rahali was obviously from Kerry and there are other Kerry men who fell. Next slide, please. This is Harry Coyle from Dublin. Harry Coyle's grandson is a member of our committee. Harry looks a real dandy as most Dublin men did in those days in the studio portrait. He was breaking down a doorway to escape rifle fire. Uh, it's believed his safety catch wasn't on his rifle and the gun, uh, his own gun shot him through the throat and he died on the spot. He's another casualty in the Moor Lane, Henry Place area. Michael Collins, a very young Michael Collins. And as I said, he was in London just before the rising and he joined the London Battalion of the Irish Volunteers and traveled over. He became aide de camp to Joe Plunkett, who, as you probably know, was very ill previously to the rising. Collins, <coughs> I believe was a, I think he had, a, he was called a staff captain. Sometimes these ranks were given during the week of Easter week. He, um, he didn't have a very high position within the Moore Street story. He took possession of the White House because at one time with the rifle fire bouncing off of the, uh, the lime wash render, they thought the White House was occupied by enemy forces. They started shooting in there and found their own men. So Collins took control and led them in to the uh, terrace. Uh, it was after Moore Street that he made one of his comments that the next time, as he put it, we go to battle, we will not be shot like fish in a barrel. And he was referring to Moore Street. He was already planning his open street guerrilla campaign. There was to be no more occupying buildings, no more making yourself a target. That's Michael Collins. This is a unique document. It was written on the cardboard backing of a photograph in the back room of number 16 Moore Street. It's written by Porig Pierce, and it's essentially a draft of the surrender order. He wrote it in crayon, and it was found in the room afterwards by the Plunkett family. The Plunkett family who owned number 16, the butchers, which was in the middle of the terrace, um, as far as we know, and there's no direct connection with Joseph Plunkett, uh, one of the 1916 leaders. Uh, Brendan Plunkett, a grandson of the Plunkett's who owned the building at the time, is a member of our committee as well and was able to, when we toured the building, point out where the room was. He told us many, many stories about how his grandmother came back to the building and found it in complete disarray. But they found this piece of card amongst the rubble and held on to it. And it's now in the National Library. Next slide, please. This is, of course, <coughs> excuse me, one of three women uh, who made it into Moore Street in the garrison. Winifred Carney, James Connolly's faithful secretary, Julia Grennan, and this lady here, Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell. A very brave and important woman. She was a nurse and she nursed the wounded, but in particular, James Connolly. And it's her that was chosen by Connolly and the rest of the leaders to walk from 
Moore Street with a flag of surrender to the British Army barricade and negotiate on behalf of the rebels, the volunteers. She was uh, in number 15 Moore Street, which is still standing. She walked very brave lady towards a very heavily armed British barricade and wanted to negotiate. She was sent back. She was looking for unconditional surrender. They said there will be no unconditional surrender. She came back to Pierce and the rest of the leaders. They sent her back again on a second mission. She was told again, unconditional. She went back and this time on the third journey, Pierce accompanied her to the barricade and it's where on Parnell Street, the very famous photograph you'll see shortly, the only photograph that was taken actually of the surrender. And there's a story attached to that. One little um, interesting point about this lady is she was a lifelong unrepentant Republican. Uh, when she died in, I think it's 1956, uh, her funeral or a requiem mass was held at Westland Row, uh, which is uh, in Dublin. And at that time, uh, I believe he was Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera uh, turned up for the funeral with his retinue. And uh, Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell's family and Julia Grennan, her faithful companion, went over to de Valera, lifted him out of the seat gently and accompanied him out of the church. He wasn't wanted. She regarded him and the rest of them as a sellout. She was a remarkable lady and um, We'll have the next slide now, please. Remarkable image again. This is the British Army barricade I was talking to you about at the top of Moore Street. I'm sure there's some people on uh, the webinar who are um, firearms buffs and they're able to probably look at those arms and tell me what they are. I think most of them would be at that time, Lee Enfield's 303s. Uh, you can look at the barricade itself. There's one man with, I think it looks like a Lewis gun or a, a rifle, it's difficult to see. He's uh, spread eagle almost on a butcher's block. Moore Street was a markets area. That butcher's block was pulled out of one of the butcher's shops. That's the barricade they faced when they charged up Moore Street with the O'Rahilly and when Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell walked up to treat for surrender. Next slide, please. And here's that image I just spoke about. Very badly taken, very underexposed. On the left is uh, Brigadier General Lowe. Beside him in the uh, light colored britches is his son, John Lowe, who went on to become a rather famous 1930s American film star, John Loder. To the right is, of course, Porrick Pierce. And if you look at feet level, you will see the extraordinary uh, image of Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell's feet and the edge and the bottom of her apron. And there is much discourse in Ireland because normally on these photographs, quite understandably, because it looks as though Pierce has four feet, people, uh, photographers, people who are doing books, they remove Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell's feet for common sense reasons. And there's a a school of opinion that's argued that somehow <clears throat> she has been airbrushed out of history. She hasn't. She made a statement before she died. She was actually on this side of the camera and you would have seen her in totality. But she actually understood the historic nature of the event and of this photograph. And she worshipped Pierce and Connolly and the leaders. And she quite simply just walked around Pierce and stood on the other side so that this image would be of him. And there's an account of that. Uh, when Pierce surrendered, he surrendered his sword to Brigadier General Lowe. And you will see if you look carefully, the end of his sword, Lowe is holding it in his hands, <coughs> the scabbard can be seen. And in the background over at the back of Pierce, you will see British Army soldiers sitting on the curb with their rifles. Pierce was taken from here, not to Kilmainham Jail. He was taken to British Army headquarters and it's there that he wrote his surrender orders. He didn't write a surrender order on Moore Street. He merely wrote that crayon on the back of the card as a template. He wrote the surrender orders in British Army HQ in the Phoenix Park. 
Next slide, please. This is one of two images that have, has come to our attention over the last couple of years. <clears throat> it was found in a small album of images belonging to a British Army officer who had served on the Western Front. And it came up for auction on eBay. One of our friends, who is a, a collector of 1916 Militaria, happened to see this album and went through the images that were available. He found a section in the album entitled Dublin 1916. And this obviously excited him. He went through the images on eBay, actually. He didn't have the album. He didn't know whether to bid for it or not. And he found this remarkable image because it is, without any doubt, the only image of James Connolly lying on his stretcher in the middle of O'Connell Street, just before he is to be taken to Dublin Castle. It's been published in the Irish Times. Uh, there was a question mark over it, but research now shows that it is Connolly. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this. If you look around the uh, stretcher of four volunteers in rather smart uniforms, this is referenced in many accounts that Connolly was actually carried by uh, officers uh, in almost parade style uniforms. And if you look, you can't see Connolly's head, unfortunately, you can see his leg raised, the white sheet over it. And of course he was injured. He had a bullet that hit him in the ankle and his leg was splinted and raised. So that's one of these finds that just comes up out of nowhere. I'm sure as years go by, we will uh, have more images uh, to come forth. Next image, please. This is the second image from that uh, British Army officer's album. And once again, it is remarkable. Uh, I'm sure Danny will make it available to anybody who wants a copy. When you blow it up and go into it, you can actually see identifiable volunteers. What you're looking at is the Moore Street garrison after surrender. We never ever thought that there was an image of this, but there it is in front of you now. And you see obviously a line of British army uh, Tommies, as they were called, a couple of officers on the right, and then behind them, up against the wall, is the 320, 340 volunteers who were in the GPO and are part of that garrison. You can't really identify anybody. The photograph, sadly, is not that detailed enough, but it's a remarkable historical artefact, and I'm very pleased to be able to present it to you here. And I think we're coming to the last image, Danny. Yes, this is more well known. It's a set, one of a set of postcards, uh, very similar to the one we saw at the beginning of the nighttime bombardment of the GPO. This is British Army officers, of course, standing uh, at the base of the Parnell Monument, and they are holding the Irish Republic flag that flew over the GPO with the tricolour. This is, of course, that remarkable flag that survived the bombardment, survived 50 years hidden in the Imperial War Museum in London and was handed back in 1966, the 50th anniversary of the Rising, and is now in our National Museum. You'll see, by the way, they have it on uh, the end of a rifle and it, um, it's, it's upside down, which is, of course, to those of you who know, the greatest insult you can uh, do to a flag. But that's the Irish Republic flag. I believe it was um, actually a green bedspread that belonged to Countess Markiewicz, and she painted the words on it, Irish Republic. It's a remarkable survivor, as is Moore Street. And so we bring this photographic presentation to an end. I hope you've learned something from it, and I hope I didn't talk for too long. Um, as both Danny said, the campaign started over 20 years ago. And the success of this campaign is the fact that the Moore Street Terrace still stands, the most important site in modern Irish history as the National Museum of Ireland state. We started the campaign in 2001 when the entire area was going to be demolished. We aimed to save one building. We ended up saving the entire terrace. But that doesn't mean that the terrace is saved. Unfortunately, we have a developer and we have a government 
who don't really respect Irish history. They don't respect the descendants of the 1916 leaders and they don't respect the will of the people, which is they want more Street restored and to rejuvenate the markets area. I want to, before I hand over to our uh, chief architect, pay fulsome uh, praise to the ancient order of Hibernians uh, for being the first organization to fund our plan. If it hadn't been for the funding we got for the digital survey of the entire site, we would not have been able to go any further. And it was the digital survey, which as you will see, is the backbone of this plan. And it was carried out in true Irish Republican fashion, covertly. We put a surveyor on the street in a Dublin City Council high-vis jacket with his various bits of equipment, and we did it under the very noses of the enemy, the developer. And before I go, I want to pay uh, homage and praise to the fact that the ancient order of Hibernians have very real skin in the game. There was between 20 and 30 of the Hibernian rifles in Moore Street in Easter week 1916. And they have been sadly, a bit like Sean McLaughlin, somewhat forgotten. But with our plan, they won't be. It's time the Hibernian rifles were not so much brought home, but the people at home made aware of them. They were extremely brave men. Don't forget that everybody who went out in Easter week 1916 fully expected to be put up against the wall and shot. Thankfully, they weren't. But uh, we hope that what we've done in holding the line, saving the terrace, and now bringing to fruition this plan, we've done our bit in honour of those remarkable people. I'd like to hand over now to Sean O'Murray, our Chief Architect, to take you through our remarkable plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, and thank you to the Ancient Order of Hibernians to give us the opportunity to speak here tonight um, on the Moore Street Historic Area Urban Master Plan. Um, I suppose, firstly, I'd like just to say that I'm speaking on behalf of the design team. Um, and just as Patrick said, Surveyors, the archaeologist, Eamon P. Kelly, uh, Kelly Cogan Architects, who are the Chief Conservation Architects, ourselves, Engineers, Garland Consultancy, the model maker, Cecil Whitford, and the visualisation for the production of the final drawings um, in Andreas. Tonight, I just want to speak about the historical context quite briefly, um, the morphology of the site, the aerial views of the site, um, existing structures of significance on Moore Street and in the hinterland, some of the materials and the details of the buildings that, that are there that are of significance, but equally um, Moore Street, uh, we'll speak about the, it's a, the actual master plan itself, um, we we'll show some images of the model, so some drawings and elevations of proposed works, um, or built interventions, and finally, I suppose, maybe most easily accessible, a series of visualizations of the proposed scheme for Moore Street. Um, as Patrick kind of outlined, and what I've always found, I suppose, exceptionally um, um, interesting, I suppose, is the backgrounds to all these people, that the way they came together, they were united by one predominant idea, and that the idea of democracy and, and, and liberty. Um, and when we speak about these people, they came from right across, not just Ireland, but from abroad as well. And we, here in the top left, the seven signatories, we have Eamon Kant from Ballymo, County, County Galway, a teacher, a musician, a father. James Connolly from Edinburgh, an Irish Republican, a socialist, a trade union leader, a husband, a father. Patrick Pierce from Dublin, an Irish teacher, a barrister, a poet, a writer. Sean McDermott from Kilclaher, County Leitrim, a Republican, member of the Irish Gaelic League, and also a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Thomas Clark, born Milford-on-Sea, but grew up in Dundannon, Dunganyan, County Tyrone, who also lived in Manorville, New York, um, a Republican, a tobacconist, and a, a husband. We've also Thomas McDonough from Clock Jordan, County Tipperary, a university lecturer, a poet, a playwright, a husband and father, and finally, Joseph Mary Plunkett from Fitzwilliam Street in Dublin, an Irish Republican, a poet, a journalist, and a husband. They all lost their lives as part of the of, of further sacrifice of what they what they did on at Easter week. And as Patrick said previously, here is the image of um, Elizabeth O'Farrell with General Pierce surrendering to General Lowe. 
And what's very significant, and I've always found it quite um, humbling, is the fact that he put on his hat and, as Patrick said, he went, marched up with his sword and that dignity, knowing that he was going facing his death for the actions taken, but doing it in such dignity. And as Patrick said, without the, the journals and the information recording of Elizabeth Farrell and the other contributors of, of Kearney, um, the, these events wouldn't be logged for us to, to document and talk about today. In the aftermath of the rising, um, in the days afterwards, there was a series of photographs taken of central Dublin. Um, on the left, you have the GPO, and on the right, you have Lynn Hall. But what I want to speak about is that when buildings were built um, over 150, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, buildings were built with kind of a durability, a robustness. There wasn't this idea that we build buildings for a 20 year or 30 year lifespan and they need to be flipped and they're done for financial motives. No, they were built for civic reasons. They had a um, strength. And that's something that we're very much interested in as we go to, re, to repurpose and um, refurbish and conserve the buildings of the Terrace of Moore Street. I want to bring you to Rome. Um, and the reason you might find this interesting is that I want to talk about the idea of urban planning and how cities are made. Um, and this is the Nali map of Rome, which was made in 1748. And if you look at the screen here, here is the Piazza Navona. If you've been to Rome, you might be familiar. Um, here's the Pantheon. Um, and basically outside of every public building, you will find a public square. And in between these squares, you'll find laneways and streets. And the idea is that when you make a public building, you face it onto a public space. And what's very significant about these, this, this map is that you go from square to, through a laneway, through a courtyard, through a terrace, through space and onto a public square. And that's the idea, the morphology and how um, cities were built. And this is a map of Dublin from just around approximately the same time. And this is in 1756. Um, and as well, this is the site where we would have, where the, the Moore Street Terrace was. And historically, prior to the terrace being built, um, it was actually what you can see here is an old brick field site. But what we found out from our archeologist, Ned Kelly, is that even before that, in, in the Viking period, it was actually a midden. And a midden is a kind of a repository place for all the, the waste from, from the settlement of the Vikings. And when we look at the, this map here, it was previously described as Saxel Street which then for became also obviously in today, O'Connor Street, this was widened and this is the site where the GPO stands today. But the reason I'm showing you this drawing is that I want to talk about how um, cities are made and the idea of making blocks. And then within these blocks, looking at kind of almost smaller plots. So if this was, if this is Saxel Street, which is now O'Connor Street, you can see the public buildings, which would have been houses originally. Then in between there would be gardens, and at the rear of the plot, you actually have um, a stables or a mews or, or the working area. And very often in between, it's just kind of a garden or a place for growing vegetables or so forth. And this basically creates what we call a plot grain, where you basically have these veins or, or ultimately the actual DNA of how the city was made. If we move to 1847, we can see that the, the Moore Street here is what we have here and Moore Lane. And this is Saxel Lane, which, ultimately, which is now O'Reilly Parade. And in between, if this is number 10, starting to start the terrace up to number 25, in between there would have been a series of courtyards, but also in some of them, the gardens were still retained in, in 1847, just two years after the, the end of the famine. But equally, you can see in between these, you can see a series of little laneways. So under these, there would have been archways um, and equally up upon here. So, Basically, within Dublin at that time, there was a porosity of how you moved, how people circulated, um, and the scale of the city was very much built on this uh, plot grain, which was, I suppose, at, at human level. Um, this is an image from the rear gardens um, at 63 Marion Square, and this was a garden that was refurbished or, or repurposed by um, the trust there. Um, what's very interesting is you can start seeing the materials of Dublin the bricks of the buildings, the, the rear terrace, but equally the limestone and these walls, which would have formed um, these plot grains. So if we go back here, you can see kind of a sample garden and in between would have been um, the walls and so forth, which would have defined these areas between the terrace houses and the mews at the back. 
This is a map from 1893, and this is a goods insurance map from, from London. But what's very interesting here is that this was done for obviously for insurance reasons for the idea about fire. But what it does is you can see here, there's, here's more street, here's more lane. The GPO would have been down here somewhere. This is the evacuation route of the volunteers on Henry Place. Um, but you can actually see the functions of the buildings and what they were, whether it was a grocery store or so forth. More Street, um, I suppose historically in Ireland and even prior to the 1916 Rising is known as a very famous markets area, as Patrick alluded to. And the Moore Street Market um, is still in existence today. And we believe that any development of the site has to go hand in glove with the actual the markets themselves, because basically any, any redevelopment and repurposing needs to work with, I suppose, the fabric of the city, the context of people um, and work with those that are all who have been trading there, not just now, but many of the traders are there are fourth and fifth generation traders on that street. This is an image, um, an aerial shot showing um, here on the right hand side, we've got O'Connell Street um, and you're probably familiar with the Spire and then this would be the GPO. This is Henry Street. This is Moore Street. This is Moore Lane. Um, up the top of the street, you've got Parnell Monument, then you've got the Rotunda. So as Patrick was describing, um, when the volunteers evacuated from the GPO, they went down uh, Henry, across Henry Street, West Pierce gave the command, down um, Henry Place, then turned on a quite, quite sharp dog leg. Then they had to pass Moore Lane. And as Patrick described earlier, there was a, a barricade and there was a firing squad down there and they had to come across. Then they came down and then the first building on the terrace, I think they might have gone into number nine originally, but they broke into number 10. And then they would have spent their first night there, the volunteers, and then they slowly moved their way up right throughout the terrace. Um, number 16 would have been the number of the building where basically the command would have been taking place. Number 15 is obviously where Nurse Kearney, um, or Nurse Fire Rotter, um, removed. Number 21, I think at the back in the courtyard, was basically where the decision was made to surrender. And as previously spoken about, just at the very end of the terrace is where um, O'Reilly was left to die after suffering um, wounds after trying to, to, to escape with a battalion. This is the survey which we had to kind of take on um, originally, as Patrick said. And what this shows is um, a kind of a laser survey. So what happened is a drone went up and took a laser survey of all the existing buildings on the site. So this is Moore Street. This is Moore Lane. This is Henry Place. So this is the existing condition, and this would be kind of number 16, this is number 10, um, and this, we're, we're, viewing, we're viewing this um, image from the back. And what we had to do, was, I suppose, as a design team, was examine the existing buildings on the site and make evaluations as to which buildings were there of significance and which buildings could be retained and which buildings, um, I suppose, as Patrick defined earlier on, had historical um, relationship with 1916. After doing this analysis, we basically were left with the buildings that you see here um, in the drawing, where we removed a lot of the interventions from the 1960s, 1970s that didn't have, um, I suppose, his, one, they didn't have, a, I suppose, a, a, build, a function that could be repurposed, but equally didn't have a historic significance. And what we drew in then on the site is basically these lines, which kind of indicating the original plots on the site. And we found we thought that this would be very significant in terms of giving us a start about where we would try and start to develop the plan as in a master plan for the proposed site. And this is a drawing which shows the, the ground floor of the proposed site. So here again would have been the GPO, the Henry Place, the evacuation. And here is number 10, so number 25, Moore Street, the terrace itself. And again, you can see the ideas of these plot grains. And um, these are under these buildings, there's a series of basements. These are the, the plotted drawings of, of the basements that we are aware of. The first floor, second floor, third floor. When we look at Dublin, um, what we, were, we went to do when we kind of initially visited the site was to actually look at the materials of the site and very specifically look at like within a cartilage of maybe 500 meters of the Moore Street site and um, to look at how windows were made, how openings were made, what were the materials used, whether it's the red brick, whether it's the stock brick from Dolphin's Barn and Gables. And again, this limestone, which, you, which is a photograph from, from um, Moore Lane. This building here is number 10. This is the gable. We believe somewhere around here is where the volunteers broke in um, 
to get into the terrace initially. And this building was built in 1773, obviously three years before um, the American Declaration of Independence. These are images showing from the rear um, on Moore Lane of the existing building stock that would have been there. Um, and we believe that this building was uh, at one point a grocery store, but also an abattoir. But on the right, um, I'd just like to show images of basically um, the cut or granite sets that exist, the stone sets that exist on the, on the street of Moore Lane. And this is an example just off O'Connell Street on Nittle Lane, where the um, stone sets have been restored, where the granite curbs have been restored, where the pavers are put. And very much as part of this master plan, we're very much interested in actually restoring not just the buildings themselves, but the area around and, and the streets and the curbs. So it brings the whole area up um, in terms of its maintenance. This is just an image from Northern Europe, and it's just showing the idea of, um, this is a square in Kalmar in Sweden, but just showing the images of basically when you use um, have public space and you use good, strong, robust materials, then the spaces themselves have a flexibility. And you note that the spaces are open, so they have an opportunity for either being markets or public events or large gatherings or even theatre or so forth. So you have flexibility of space. And I think that's really important when you make public space, that it has to have that flexibility and adaptability to different public functions um, down through the time. So this brings us to basically this drawing is kind of a plan um, of the ground floor for what our, our master plan and basically what I suppose fundamentally, what are we trying to achieve? Um, well, first and foremost, we're trying to respect history, right going back right to the, the, the historic site of the, the Midden from the Vikings, but obviously more in more recent times to the more serious, more estate and ultimately obviously onto 1916 in, in, the, last, in the last century. Um, and also to have an empathy, as we spoke about earlier, with the plot grain, with the actual buildings themselves and the grain of the city that would have been ultimately the, the DNA and the building blocks of the city itself. If you look across to the other side of the street, these scale of buildings would have existed in the 50s and 60s before they were all knocked down to build a shopping centre, which, as we spoke about um, earlier, a lot of these contemporary buildings that are made in glass and steel, they really only have a lifespan of 50 or 60 years. So when we talk about a, a thing about a circular economy, or um, I suppose sustainability, they don't have that level or degree of sustainability in terms of construction. Um, and also, I suppose, if this plan is supposed to be a successful plan, it cannot just simply be one that's based on history. It has to have, um, I suppose, a living history. And that, and that is the idea of creating a living quarter, a sense of place, a place where people can actually um, live, um, but also that creates this idea of passive surveillance so that you people living there over shops, um, over courtyards, over the laneways. So there's activity there, not just during the daytime, but also in the evening time. It has to be a place for, for all the members of society, but equally for the elderly people and young people so that they can live um, in harmony. We also want to preserve the unique character of the site, obviously in relation to the materials, the history, more specifically the 1916 Rising and equally the, the traders that exist on Moore Street. But also we want to kind of explore this idea about what I spoke about when we spoke about Rome, the idea of porosity, the idea that you might actually walk down the laneways, come through a courtyard, come under an archway, into a courtyard in, and so forth, and move through basically in a very much more a human scale through the city. The next image is a kind of an image which just basically shows the idea of the courtyards being highlighted in a, in a kind of a, a yellow, and basically then the spaces in between, which would have been the houses, where there's opportunities to replant um, and bring in some of the supposed green space within the city. And what this does is I suppose it brings in a, a green lung, the idea of vegetation. And I suppose we all know this in times of COVID that, you know, nature, we've come to kind of enjoy and, and uh, respect nature. And I suppose as we move through in terms of cities, having nature and having good fresh air is very significant, both to our well-being and to our mental health. As part of our project, um, and I suppose from the survey, we've been making basically um, a model and a model in, this model is made um, in timber in Irish ash. Um, and it's basically a model of the site. And what we proposed to do was actually build in all the various buildings as we're moving through the whole project. I suppose I'd like to identify that this whole presentation and the work that we're doing is a work in progress. Um, and as we go through, I will go, be going into the, the various buildings as we're going through. And this model was built by Cecil Whitford um, for us. 
and an incredible, incredible detail in terms of the buildings themselves. These are just a series of drawings which show a diagram of the proposed works whereby we'll have housing and um, a section through the site from O'Reilly Parade down to Henry Place, a section through Moore Street, through the terrace itself to the courtyards. Um, and you can see this key in the plan below where, where these sections are being taken. As part of our studies, we've been kind of doing elevation studies to try and kind of get back to, so this is the existing drawing of what the Moore Street Terrace is. And you can see it's in a very much a dilapidated state. Um, there's number 14 to number, number 17, which are actually currently on in the ownership of the state, which are a national monument, and number 24 and number 25, which are in the possession of Dublin City Council and the rest of the buildings at present are in the ownership of the developer. So we started doing initial studies about if we were to take the terrace and um, looking back at the scale of the windows, the scale of the panes, making looking at the sash windows and how we'd actually, this was kind of an initial early studies as how the terrace would come together. And then some studies on the rear elevation from the existing elevation to the potential of the proposed the rear. And here are a series of drawings through north and south of Henry, Henry Place. And then this would have been the evacuation route um, from Henry Place down at the corner and so forth. As part of the scheme, um, we spoke about that we need to have this idea of a living quarter, an area where people can live. And as we said previously, that from numbers 10 to 25, that well, they'll, for the most part, they'll be repurposed with, um, I suppose, commercial functions and shops and eateries and cafes, so forth, potentially on the ground floor. Above them, the idea would be that there would be accommodation. But then moving up to O'Reilly Parade, the idea is that we'd have actually a series on the ground floor, incubation units for small business startups, and on the upper floors, and um, the potential for accommodation from either small family units, and here are the incubation units, small family units to actually um, larger units at the end, for a large, um, and then also one bedroom units for single occupancy. The design of the accommodation is, is very simple. It's basically on the north, you've got the sleeping accommodation, and then the south, where there's more light, you've got the living accommodation, and then they will face out and onto the main uh, northern courtyard as part of the master plan. And the idea again is that, that the people will um, kind of directly relate onto the public spaces. And then this is just going through the master plan itself and the functions. This building here will have a public function. It will within has have service for the community, but also on the top floor, the idea is that there'll be incubation units again for businesses. Going down, the idea is then that we're actually continuing this idea with the plot grain, where the buildings um, from Moore Street with the, with the walls will go through and the idea of building um, accommodation and houses on the rear lane. This is just a plan showing the proposed um, housing and the idea is that they're built around small courtyards allowing light and ventilation to go through. Again, the buildings, um, the principle and the design of the buildings is that they're, they're actually gable, they're gable fronted and they also have returns which basically um, allow for these courtyards and this was inspired from the actual, the rears of the properties um, from 10 to 25 on Moore Street itself. This is again a little bit more detailed uh, drawings of the plans. Number 14 to number 17, going back to the terrace itself, um, at present it's um, a national monument, it's in the ownership of the state, and the idea would be then for potentially for number 16, which would have been the headquarters um, during the occupancy of the terrace, to, that that has the potential to become a commemorative centre, but equally the rear building here then um, could potentially have I suppose more of the sort of more the digital and the the information where the bit this building number sixteen itself would almost be like the Anne Frank House where basically um, people would book and go in and see um, and and experience the actual rooms themselves where the volunteers would have been um, during the occupancy of the buildings. This so again is the, the rear is the bottom of the site to the O'Brien's Bottling Factory, and just as Patrick spoke about, and um, this would be number ten. I just go back to show you exactly where it is. On the plan, this is number 10. Again, just going back, this is where, where the side entrance of the GPO, the volunteers would come up, the barricade would be put here. And then the British would have been firing their bullets right straight down. And as Patrick said, um, you know, you can see the actual the pop marks of the bullet holes on the wall. But as part of our scheme, in terms of the urban, urban um, scale, if you look back in this old photograph, you can actually see the stone sets, you can see the granite curbing. And our intention would be to bring back that level of um, detail into the buildings. But also you can see here to the, the left of the White House, there's a laneway. And a lot of these laneways sadly have been blocked up. So this idea about the porosity of the city and movement of the city has been lost. 
So very much as part of our scheme is to actually reopen these laneways. Um, so that basically that this new historic quarter for the heritage of the, the, the birth of the Irish nation, that basically it's a place for people, a place for living and a place for movement through. We've basically, as Patrick said, sorry to go back, we believe that a lot of the, um, this building, this building was actually demolished from what we understand in 1924, but a lot of the base of the building, the actual walls themselves from what we understand, um, are still in existence and they're being plastered over. So buildings, of, I suppose, as what we would say has have a critical role um, within the 1916 rising, we believe that they should be restored and um, brought back to the significance of their piece. And as I said earlier, we are working with the design team and basically we're making a model of each building um, through the project so that the idea is that when the final presentation happens, that we'll have a model to describe the actual experience and to point out the movements through as you go through. And each model, I suppose, is at a scale of one to 200. This is at the white building. And just to give you kind of a sense of scale, it's about the size of a matchbox. And they're beautifully made by one of our collaborators in the studio came in. And the, all these drawings are being made by another collaborator, James, who are doing incredible work for us in the studio. This is again down to Henry Place. Um, and again, showing the existing building as there today um, and a, a, um, a model of that building. And again, as uh, Patrick spoke about earlier, the O'Brien's bottling where, um, and this building is a kind of a model of the existing building itself. This is showing then potential on the opposite side of the laneway for the potential of the buildings there. At this point of the presentation, I'd just like to talk about the idea of um, our building fabric. And on the left hand side is a building um, number 18, Ormond Key. And on the right hand side is uh, an image of the building when it was restored. And this building was restored by the architect James Kelly of Kelly Cogan Architects, and he's working very closely in collaboration with us. Um, and the reason I'm showing this image is it just shows the value of these buildings. Not only are they of value historically, but they're extremely beautiful. And they're, um, I suppose, in the idea of the significance of what Dublin is. I mean, when you come to Dublin, the idea is that when you see Dublin, you see the, the white granite from Wicklow, you see the, the particular type of bricks, you see the, that type of co uh, coining, you see the, um, the capping. And these, these buildings, I suppose, are, are of an incredible um, significance. So the idea of starting to actually restore the terrace and bring the buildings back to, to fruition and the beauty that they would have once had um, is, is, I suppose, a significant ambition of this, 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 this master plan. I'm just going to start showing you then finally just some images from the scheme and basically just to bring everyone back again, here's the GPO, there was where Pierce would have given the order and the volunteers would have come down. They would have come down this lane with Henry Place and just on the dog leg on the corner, you have um, the O'Brien's Bottling Factory, which was obviously repurposed in the 1960s, but what we believe is that on the ground level that some of the building from 1916 is still in existence. And our plan is basically to restore this building have it as um, a public function on the ground floor and then the idea of potentially having it, um, accommodation on the upper floor. And just as we showed the other buildings that they would actually have accommodation on the upper floor um, and then public functions um, on the ground floor. And then in the rear here, you can see number 10, which would have been the White House. And very significantly um, that the, basically that these lanes get reoccupied so that, um, that there's an activity there, not just showing the daytime, but also again, as I said, during the nighttime. Here's an image of the existing building um, of number 10, Henry Place, which is the white building. And this, this is the laneway that we spoke about earlier on, which has been blocked up, sadly blocked up. And as I said, our ambition with the master plan is to actually op reopen these laneways, get the circulation moving back um, and have a footfall across these laneways. And again, if you look closely at this image, you can actually see the granite sets that are on from this image here from 1916. Those granite sets are still there under the tarmac. And it's a case of just basically lifting the tarmac and restoring, repurposing the street. And this is an image of what we hope to achieve by basically the restoration, whereby again, you'd hear it with the White House, this is the lane and um, more place to reopen this and then bring back the, the, the materiality of the street. And then any new buildings that we do make, then we make them with the materials, as we spoke about earlier, that is of that context and that site. And that the idea then that there would be ideas like detailing and stonework and so forth, that would bring, I suppose, a kind of a level of craftsmanship um, to the, that this historic area of Dublin. As part of our research into the terrace itself, obviously because um, there aren't a lot of images um, of the terrace, 
we've had to kind of, I suppose, go through to archives and, and um, look at basically historical images and drawings. And some drawings have been produced retrospectively by Flora Mitchell, show number 14 to number 12, um, number 12 to 14 um, Moore Street, but also the significance of the, you can see of the traders, historically of the awnings and so forth. And you can see in these drawings, you've got very peculiar um, elevations and what these buildings are where they're gable fronted buildings so basically what gable fronted means is that the roof uh, in, in at the behind is facing this way where normally in the Georgian buildings the the roofs actually ran parallel to the front wall but this is just um, showing what the, the buildings would have been looking like historically and also as part of our research we've been re researching into um, I suppose the how shop fronts were made at the time. And this is an example um, of Barnwell's on Castle Street in Dublin, which was restored. And basically you can see this idea of the tripartite shop front. We've got the three sections, you have a split door, you've got then the, all the different casings um, and the coins and the entablatures and so forth. And basically then you can see what's also very interesting. Um, you've got the main door, which, is all, which was generally a split door and um, into the shop, kind of a double door. But to the side, the idea that you'd actually have an access point for the accommodation above. And so basically, when the street is restored for more street, the idea is that, again, as we said, that the accommodation would be above. And basically, then you have a series of shops on the lower on the lower level of the street. And this is an image. And um, this is number 14 to number 17. This is number 16, which would mean obviously the headquarters of the Rising. We're doing a series of drawings, basically. To, and this is, I suppose, work in prog progress, showing the historic nature of buildings going back to restoring the actual the um the, the gables and so forth and bringing back the buildings and and the actual shop fronts themselves to what they would have been like somewhat around the time of the of that period in the 1916 and this is the first drawing i suppose which actually shows what the potential is of the terrace itself um, and this is going for number 10 and as previously spoken about this is where the volunteers would have broken in originally um, and up first occupied, and then as, as as everyone knows, they actually got into the buildings themselves, and then broke through each each gable wall between the buildings, um, and up and right through and occupied the full terrace. And I suppose at this point of the presentation, I suppose I'd like to kind of suppose pay gratitude both both to Patrick Cooney and to Jim Connolly and the members. Um, of the campaign that have actually saved this terrace because 20 years ago the proposal was from a developer to knock all this terrace and however they've campaigned for over 20 years to basically secure this part of history not only have they um, through their incredible work saved the terrace but now we have the potential of actually repurposing the terrace so that when people come not just from Ireland but from across the world to come to this area Dublin that they can actually retrace the steps of the volunteers that they can go down through the market area they can um, and explore and live and I suppose in a living history of this very significant part of Irish history and this is an image um, that we've developed with our renders showing the actual terrace itself that was restored today. So basically going back, looking at bringing back the gables where they, they've been, if they've been demolished or else bringing back the, um, the windows and going back to the Flora Mitchell drawings, looking at the idea of the um, awnings and so forth. And equally um, looking at basically going back to this kind of what I was showing you previously, this idea of the tripartite shop fronts and so forth and the gables. And again, just I suppose, repurposing the street right down to the level of, I suppose, the paving and bringing it back to a kind of a sense where these buildings are given the, the due respect and significance that they that they deserve. Um, this is an image of the current situation at the very end of the terrace. So this is basically, again, a drawing showing the kind of dilapidated nature of the existing buildings in the terrace at present. This is um, an image showing number 25, number 24. This is where O'Rahilly would have fallen um, and was left to die. Um, and then you've got number 22 and number 23. And this is, I suppose, in 19, there was a fire here, I think, in the 1960s. And then it was a kind of a modernist um, elevation of a building put in. Um, and the current function of this building is that it's um, owned by Dublin City Council and it's used as a depot for um, recycling at present. But what, what we'd like to do, and this shows, I suppose, in the site plan, up at the top of the plan, where these, these buildings are. But I suppose when we make an intervention, you can see that these buildings, when they were put in, 
you can see the scale of the buildings that were put in historically. So going back to the idea of this plot grain, but when these buildings went in, they actually, I suppose, cut down and kind of amalgamated buildings and so forth. And then again, it happened here. But when we restore the buildings or repurpose the buildings, we would like to go back to this idea of we're aware that we have to make new buildings at this part of the site. However, these buildings have to have a sympathy and an empathy with the plot grain. So basically, again, if this is number 20, uh, 22 rather, you can see that this is a building itself and the proportion is defined by the windows. And again, the idea is that shops are put in on the ground levels, living accommodation is put on, on the lower level, on the upper levels. Um, and the materials themselves are the materials of Dublin, the idea of using the Wicklow white granite and um, the very particular red brick um, and repurposing then um, the, the paving and so forth so that it's appropriate for this historic area of Dublin. This is an image um, at Moor Lane. Um, just to give you an idea, this is somewhere just around here, um, which would be at the back of number 16, which on, on Moor Street. And I visited the site originally, um, I think it was three and a half years ago with Patrick and Jim. This is probably one of the buildings that when I saw it, um, I was actually bowled over by the quality, beauty um, and potential of this building. And if anyone actually has an opportunity and you're looking if you're, if you're in the coming week, maybe or weeks to actually go on to Google Earth and drop the man down and go down through the streets, you can actually see all these buildings as they are today um, and see the condition they're in. But this building, I suppose, why we find it so beautiful, it has all the limestone that we spoke about previously, it has the granite, it has the red bricks. And behind this, um, I suppose, breakdown, you actually have an archway. And the idea would be that actually, when this building is restored, that we would actually have the potential to enter back into um, an area whereby this would be the courtyard for the museum. And this is number 16. Um, so the idea that this could potentially be the entrance. So going back to the idea, I suppose, as we spoke about earlier, that you have this idea about porosity, the idea of moving through, the idea of crossing thresholds into spaces behind, and that is actually a movement of people and a footfall right across the area. And again, the idea in, internally within the courtyards that there's, um, there's, the gardens are, re, are repurposed and there's green space um, put in at the back. It's the final slide that I'd like to show, and this, I suppose, talks about the idea of not just only about the idea about heritage, and this is a document that was produced by the World Bank, um, and it's called uh, The Economics of Uniqueness, and I just like to quote from that, and that basically, a city's conserved historic core can differentiate that city from competing locations, branding it nationally and internationally, thus helping the city to attract investment and talented people. Heritage anchors people to their roots, builds self-esteem and restores dignity. And I think what we have here um, in Moore Street and in the hinterland area is one of the most significant uh, locations um, for our modern Irish history. And the idea that, that we don't restore this um, or that, that it's not brought back to, I suppose, a living monument to the testament of the volunteers from 1916 and, I suppose, a place whereby people can trade on the street and people can live and it's, it's not brought back to a cultural quarter is totally unacceptable. Um, and I suppose we really, I suppose, are grateful to get the opportunity to, to speak tonight, both to um, here and for the AOH, and um, because we believe that this is an incredibly important juncture in Irish history, because if we don't restore this terrorist now, the question is, when are we going to restore this? Um, and then I suppose on behalf of the design team and be, on behalf of everyone here, that we're very grateful for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, um, and I'll leave it back to James, if that's okay, to Jim Connolly to take care. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, can you hear me, Danny? Yes? You're good, Jim. Yeah, uh, well, just to thank Sean, um, I'd also like to echo um, the sentiments expressed by Patrick, um, to thank you, Danny, and the AOH for your incredible support. Um, every campaign, a campaign in particular that lasts 20 years as ours have, flags from time to time. But your intervention and your interest in the area and in supporting the campaign has been crucial in revitalizing us when we were when revitalization was very badly needed. So we can't thank you enough and um, we obviously look forward to your continuing support. I think we've seen this evening a remarkable presentation in the sense that most campaigns are against something and you build your support on that basis. And here we've reached um, a point in our campaign where, when we're actually uh, seeking support for something positive. 
And what we're seeking support for is the regeneration of a battlefield. And um, I know in America, we, we at one time had the great support of Robin Heaney, who was connected to the US Battlefield Trust. And she um, visited the laneways of history, as we call Moore Street with us on a, um, on a tour. And she made the point, she said, you know, in America, we're trying to save battlefields and they mostly consist of fields. And what you have here is a jewel, a battlefield that you can touch and feel and walk through a battlefield consisting of streets in the center of a city. I mean, it, the evacuation from the GPI we talked about earlier, Danny, it was a remarkable and is a remarkable story. And the, and the remarkable story of our time is it took citizens to save it because it was about to be flattened by developers with the connivance of Dublin City Council, our elected representatives. And the remark, one of the remarkable um, aspects of the campaign is that citizens made a stand that this area couldn't be demolished. And we have it today, and it's a question now of what we're going to do about it. Do we still leave it in the hands of private developers, or do we as citizens have a say have a, in the future development of the area? And it's the difference, uh, difference between, I suppose there are two approaches to this. You can have a commercial approach from a developer point of view, or you can have a battlefield approach with a commercial element to it. And that's the divergence. So, I mean, I don't want to hog the line. I, I think we've had enough time. I'd like to hear what, what your members have got to say about the plan. And of course, we're seeking your support for the plan. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. And thanks in particular to you, Danny, and the AOH. Thank you, uh, Jim, Patrick, and Sean. And before we go to Judge McKay, I'd just like to share one photo real quick here. And if you look at this photo and you look above the P there on Plunkett, and you see that little plaque right there. That is the commemoration of the Moore Street battlefield today. That's it. And if you've ever been, and we talked about it today over and over again, if you've ever been to Gettysburg, obviously um, it's a different type of commemoration. And when we look at this battlefield, I think this is what got the AOH involved in the first place. And I remember, I think it was 2014, or 2015, when we first had the opportunity to meet James Heron and um, get a tour, a personal tour, and looking at that plaque, and that stuck with me to this day. And uh, I know Patrick brought up the uh, the donation, which we were honored to uh, be part of. And I I, I think that the the vision um, that we have as the AOH began with Judge McKay, and so I'm going to turn it over for to Judge for comments and questions. And then we'll go to Daniel Taylor, um, Sean Pender, and then uh, anybody on the uh, Zoom who wishes to ask a question or make a comment, we'll welcome you on. Judge? Thank you, Danny. Uh, I'd like to just say, wow, uh, what a presentation. And thank uh, James, Sean, and Patrick uh, for such insightful uh, history in the making. Uh, Danny and I uh, and the AOH got first introduced to Moore Street several years ago. And it's where we conceive the possibility of commemorating uh, the uh, Hibernian help uh, during the rising. Um, as you all, uh, Danny pointed out, a little bitty plaque that that uh, was the only commemoration for Moore Street, the, I think one of the most sacred uh, uh, places uh, in um, in Ireland uh, in, in tunes uh, connected to the Republic. So uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the gentleman uh, on you have institutionalized the development of Moore Street. Uh, and I remember the fights that were going on back then. You never knew where the, the, the developers were, whether the politicians were given to talk to you, et cetera. Uh, and we are glad to play a, a role, although small role at this time, um, in the realization of your dream and your vision. We also have a vision and uh, Danny and I uh, and the rest of the Hibernians are gonna become alive uh, and uh, in, in that vision, in that some type of monument, if you've been to any Civil War monuments in the United States, uh, we were very uh, fortunate to have one at Antietam. Antietam is a very special uh, battlefield of our Civil War, and uh, the AOH uh, erected a monument there uh, to commemorate uh, Bloody Lane and the, the fighting, the, the 69th, the Irish Regiment. Uh, that uh, for the Union side, even though I'm a Southern boy, uh, it still is very awe-inspiring uh, to see this um, um, at Antietam. 
So I, I think it's exciting to be part of it. Thank you all for, for keeping this stream alive. Thank you, Danny O'Connell, for uh, continuing to leave uh, our vision uh, in the future for Moore Street. Thank you so much. God bless. Sean Pender. Thank you, uh, Dan, for putting this on. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for, for uh, giving this presentation. Patrick, the, the history of the photos, uh, tremendous. James, just the fact that I'm talking to someone who's direct uh, lineage to James Conley is, is amazing. And uh, I applaud your, your fight and your dedication. And Sean, thank you for a very thorough uh, and a review of a very ambitious plan that hopefully we can help on. Um, but it's hard to believe in 2021 that you, you guys are working so hard to do this. You know, um, it's it's like a shake my head type of moment. Why hasn't this been done before? Um, I live down the road from the old barracks in Trenton, which is, you know, uh, we're rich in uh, revolutionary in Philadelphia and Boston. Jim mentioned the, the Civil War and we have places in the country, the civil rights where we've taken the time to re to to remember this. And, and I think someone said, you know, it, it, this could really help differentiate, Dub you know, Dublin for more more history. Um, and educate a lot of people. And, and I think, uh, not meaning to aggravate anybody, but I think it would go a long way maybe educating a lot of Irish who I think have put this in their, in their rear view area. So I give you, I commend you for the great work that you've done to bring this into the uh, forefront. And it's just, just a shame that um, previous governments haven't, haven't seen the value of this. And uh, I know Dan and uh, the judge have been such uh, great supporters of this and we look forward to doing whatever we can to make this uh, uh, a possibility and to, um, you know, take care of this. What I kind of see is a glaring oversight by the Irish government. Of, of They should be doing this in a heartbeat. This, this, is, this is the history of, and the birth of a nation on those streets. And it's, it's hard to believe that uh, it's not been done. But thank you for your hard work and dedication for, for decades. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Dan Taylor. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Patrick, uh, James, and Sean, I want to thank you for the, the great work you've done and the fascinating presentation tonight. Uh, Sean, you mentioned the fact that the volunteers tunneled their way through uh, the terrace. Uh, and uh, as we understand from firsthand accounts, they perhaps had one pickaxe and, and one crowbar and worked through the night to work their way from building to building. What can uh, you tell us about the condition of the interior of any of these buildings? And is there a possibility or has there been the uncovering of any of these passageways that were broken through the walls between the structures? Um, I might defer that question to Patrick, if that's okay, simply because um, I suppose this is actually a very interesting question that you're saying that we've put all this master plan and design together on the fact that we've never actually been allowed into the buildings themselves. So we've only ever had, as we said, as Patrick spoke about it previously, is actually late. all our access has been external. Um, and all we've had to rely upon are the reports that have been produced um, historically. But as you know yourself, if you're an architect or you're trying to develop something or design something, you can do so much from reports, but you actually have to survey and, and actually experience the buildings themselves. But Patrick actually has all the very specific information. So if, if it's okay, I'll refer him to, for him to you on the actual breakthroughs and so forth. That's okay. Yeah, okay, Sean. Uh, Danny, yeah, it's uh, remarkable because, yes, those, what they're called creep holes. When they knocked through, they crept through. And um, they have been found. They have been located behind the plaster. They've peeled the plaster off sections of the interior walls and they've found the creep holes with um, brick infills. And when they started tunnelling in number 10, they made sure that they didn't tunnel on the same level because they fully expected to find a British Army sharpshooter at the end that would shoot right through those holes. So what they did was they tunneled through on one level, got into the next building, went down a level and tunneled in a basement back up to the second floor. So it's literally, it goes like that, like a Greek key pattern all the way through the terrace. And uh, this has proved problematic for the developers because um, a lot of they mainly say that there's only oh there's only four buildings that survived pre 1916 because what happened was since 1916 a number of buildings have been refaced 
with with new bricks or or new concrete when you peel those facades off you find the carcass or the structure of the original building behind and lo and behold the tunneling and this is a huge problem for the developer because suddenly buildings that they said were 1960s have turned out to be lo and behold buildings pre-1916 i'll just hand over to jim connolly quickly to see if he's got anything to say on that matter no i, I mean the remarkable thing is you can actually retrace you, you can you can follow in the footsteps of the volunteers through the terrace now through the creep holes that patrick has described and it, it has been a problem for the for the from a developer point of view because we argued for instance that there was a remnant of wall between 12 and 13, which are two modern builds, if you like, on the terrace. And that was ignored for years. Our engineer spotted the, the uh, party wall and um, elements from the street, you could see were, uh, eight, were, were an 18th century facade or a party wall. And only recently the developers have admitted that they have discovered within 12 and 13, a creep hole, which proves that the wall that party wall between 12 and 13 is an original wall. So despite the appearance from the street, which is what we can only go on, as, as Sean has, has, has outlined, we're not allowed into the buildings because the developer owns them, they're privately owned. So it's very, it's very difficult to know exactly what is in there. And one of our calls, apart from stage intervention, has been a consistent call. We need an independent assessment or survey of the entire terrace. We need an independent, because to date we've had experts in adverted commas for the developer sending in reports on what they've discovered. But this is, from our point of view, point of view, it's crucial that we have an independent assessment that can be believed. Because if we're going to continue in this vein, we could well end up demolishing a building that we, that, that in fact can be proven to be linked to the rising and linked to the, the evacuation, but it'll be lost. So that's, you know, a key to this is, is state intervention and through that state intervention would be independent assessment of the buildings. Jim, who owns 16? The state, um, well, it's a long story, but when the economic crash happened in Ireland, the, 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 the previous developer called Chartered Land they went into, into NAMA because they had gone bust. So NAMA, the state actually were in a position where they owned the entire site and decided, NAMA decided, who were an independent entity, they decided that it was in the public interest to auction off the site, except they were they, the proviso for the auctioning off of the site was that 14 to 17 would be kept under state ownership. So we 14 to 17, in state ownership, and with the last two houses still in city council ownership. So we, we talked earlier about the state having an interest or interest in calling for state intervention. It's unique, this site, or the development of the site is unique in the sense that the state have a real interest in this because they, they own property and can dictate the terms upon which this area should be developed. Any other questions there, Dan? I'll pass it on to other members of the panel. Okay. Um, uh, Brother Cook, you, you're muted. Yes, from uh, YouTube, we did have a, a question. Uh, what does the name uh, Moore Street come from? Um, Jim, do you want to take that? Or Sean? Jim, you Sean. can take it if you wish. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, so from what I understand, it comes from um, the Moore Estate. Um, so, Moore, yeah. so basically, in Dublin, there was a series of, uh, I suppose, landowners who would have owned tracts or plots of land like Gardner, Gardner Estate, Moore Estate. So um, this area and then that street uh, would have been called after him and also Moore Lane as well. Excellent. As we're uh, time to uh, wrap up here, as we're at uh, about an hour and 24 of an hour and 30, I wanted to thank Dan Taylor for putting this together on our end. Uh, Chris Cook, who we would not have these events without. Uh, Judge McKay, who uh, really had the idea to get into the virtual world uh, for the convention, his last convention. And of course, Sean Pender, 
who, um, who's been so helpful as our uh, vice president working on all these, uh, all these events. I'd like to give each of uh, you um, a last comment and we'll go to our close, which we have a little song from our 1916 Easter commemoration in Rockland County. So uh, gentlemen, it's, it's, you've got your closing comments. John. Oh, thank you uh, for doing this. And uh, would look forward to a time in the not too distant future where we could meet on Moore Street and uh, uh, talk about this, uh, you know, uh, in, in person. But thank you for all your work. Uh, looking forward to assist you in any way we can. God bless. Thank you. Sean, any other comments? Uh, the other Sean. Dublin, Sean. Well, hi. And no, just on behalf of all the design team, thank you for the opportunity to speak. We're very grateful and we look forward to collaborating with everyone um, on the other side of the pond on this very bright and uh, incredible project. Karen Kane, our national ladies president, was on the call today as well, and she just sends along her congratulations. And we'll move to Patrick for comments. Closing. Yeah, comments. just one. I, I really think this the, the the union between the AOH and us, uh, a recent union, uh, a, a revisiting of a union that's over a hundred years old, is very fortuitous. And I can tell by just uh, the way that you've received the presentation and the way. You, most American Irish feel that we're in a good place with you and uh, your continued support is welcome. Uh, Moore Street does belong, as we've always said, to everybody who wants it. But let's not forget the Hibernian rifles. It belongs yes, to you. Sir, we, we absolutely won't forget that. Uh, James Conley Heron. Well, the crucial link in 1916 was the link between the US and the volunteers in Dublin, um, pre-rising and during the rising. And it's fantastic that that link remains true today and no better place than in, than in our combined efforts to save what is the birthplace of the Republic. And long may our links to you continue and long may we battle together to see this dream realized. Thank you all. I'm Danny O'Connell, National President for the Ancient Order Hibernians. We thank each and every participant here today, uh, live on uh, Zoom live on YouTube, and this will be on YouTube uh, moving forward. So we'll be able to share it around the world, around the uh, country, and, and gain even more support for this great event. Thank you for your time.
I need 